for I long to see you in order that I might impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. And I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you, and thus far I've been prevented, in order that I might obtain some fruit among you, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I'm under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Thus, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. To everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Father, thank you for this great apostle and the way he lived his life as an example to pastors and Christians across the world. Thank you for his attitude towards obtaining fruit, the fruit of people who are lost and need to be won. Thank you that he said he was eager, that he was under obligation, and that he was not ashamed. May those statements characterize us. I'm eager. I'm under obligation. I'm not ashamed. Thank you that his eagerness was rooted in the fact that he saw that you had entrusted a stewardship to him, that he had a stewardship to discharge. May we see that same stewardship, and may we not ever be ashamed, knowing that the eternal destiny of men and women and boys and girls are based on what they do with Christ. Thank you for the power of the gospel. And we ask that our friend day, just a few weeks away in November, that you would bless it, that you would not only equip us how to share our faith, but on that Sunday that you would bring people online and you would bring people to these auditoriums who have never met Christ as Lord. So help us not just to write it off as another friend day, but may we be faithful stewards of what you've entrusted to us. Thank you that your heart is not just to bring people into the kingdom, but to mature them, to grow them, as we've been studying in these recent weeks. And thank you for the role that shepherds and pastors play in that. So this morning, as we open our word, your word, to worship you, give us minds that are keen and alert. Help us not to be distracted. May the Spirit of God have total freedom today to speak to us. I pray that he would help me, and again tonight as we have meet the pastor, may he fill me and anoint me and use me, I ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Take God's word with you this morning and turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. You can see I want to speak this morning on the heart of an elder. I want to speak on leaders in the local church. You know, every time we do the annual elder affirmation, in more recent years, because it's been a while since I've addressed this topic, we always have so many new Christians each year, folks have said, well, what really is an elder? And uh, what does it mean? What are they supposed to do? Now, some of you are listening to me this morning, and you already have a clear understanding of what an elder is. And still others, you're thinking, well, I will never be an elder, so this sermon is not for me today. Listen, any sermon a pastor preaches, if the Bible is open, it's for you. Because all Scripture is given by the breath of God, and in some way, shape, or form, it is profitable. So I want to speak about elders in the local church. And there are so many facets of leadership in our culture today that are really deficient. There was a time when we had more leaders than we have today. And a leader is a guy who is not just walking to the front of the line and raising his hand and saying, I'm a leader. He's not a person who puts his finger in the wind and find out what people want and then be the first to represent them. No, biblical leadership is someone who knows what to do that is right based on the infallible, inerrant, eternal word of God and then is willing to defend that and call others to follow. And Jesus taught that as his people, we are to be salt and light. And one of the reasons I believe that the culture is degenerating is because the church is downgrading. We have less and less believers who are bright lights and who, like salt, are able to preserve righteousness. And we have elders today who don't want to stand or step on anyone's toes. 
and they're afraid to offend anyone. Pastors all across America. Add to that, you have folks who've been in churches where there's been a moral breach, some loss of confidence and leadership, and you were heartbroken over it, and then you come to a church like this, and you're trying to warm up to the next guy in the pulpit. And so we need to know what an elder is to be like and what really qualifies him and what is his role. I don't know if you've ever noticed it before, but in many churches, the congregation votes on everything or the church is run by committees. Is that what God dictated for church government? Does God want the church to be managed by committees or maybe by a a few strong families that have been there forever? What is God's plan? And so we need to clearly define biblical eldership. And you need to be able to understand it, not just for yourself, but as you help new believers, as you help your own children to understand what it means. So I want to begin this morning by reading our text of Scripture. There's an outline for those of you who are online. You can print it out or you can just write off of your computer. Though I want you to bring a paper copy of the scripture. Look, I I was a tester for the very first electronic Bible that ever came out. Today they call it Logos, me and a handful of other guys. And there's a role and there's a place for it, but you cannot learn the Bible through an electronic Bible in its truest sense. You'll never find your way around it. You'll never get a working knowledge of Scripture. So you need to bring a paper copy, and if you don't have one, come to meet the pastor, and we will supply one. 1 Peter chapter 5, follow along. Therefore, exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder in witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory of that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. If you're using the note-taking outline, there are three major truths about an elder that I want us to ponder this morning. First, the attributes of an elder. What are the attributes of an elder? Look now at verse 1. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. If you've read Peter's two letters and you've examined his life from the gospel, you learn he's a pastor's pastor. And like any good elder... Like any good pastor, he was a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. A good pastor must be a witness of something. Doctrinally, experientially, personally, he has to know. And what did Peter give witness to? One, to the death of the Lord Jesus. And so he preached much of how the Lord Jesus suffered and died. But he also had a glimpse of glory there on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so he preached on the crucifixion, how Christ died for your sins, in your place, bearing your wrath, so that by his death and resurrection alone, you can be a forgiven person. But he also preached on the coronation of Christ. He preached that Christ would come again to judge the living and the dead and to rule and to reign for a thousand years before he carries us into that eternal state. Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Paul said, we'll be caught up in the twinkling of an eye. He said that when the trumpet of God is sounded, that Christ will come. He'll raise the dead in Christ first, and those of us who are alive will be caught up, and together we will be with the Lord forever. He'll take us up in the rapture. We'll be with him in heaven. We'll come back with him to rule and reign with him for a thousand years, and we'll be with him for all of eternity. And so a pastor must preach on the crucifixion and the coronation of Christ, or he should not be a pastor. And I say pastor because the word elder, pastor, overseer, is used interchangeably in the New Testament. It's not three offices, but one office expressed with three different words. And so he begins by unfolding for us three attributes of a biblical elder. First, 
there on your outline, elders are to be several in number. Elders are to be several in number. Now, it's interesting to note that in the New Testament, the number of elders in the local church is always described in the plural. There's not a single biblical verse in the New Testament to define a single elder form of government. On Paul's first missionary journey, Luke notes for us in Acts chapter 14, and when they had appointed elders, there it is in the plural, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, a plurality of elders in each and every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Paul said to the church at Philippi, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Overseers, that's another term for elder, and deacons. Those are the only two remaining offices in the New Testament church. The office of apostle is no longer with us because to be an apostle, you had to have seen the risen Christ. You had to have been personally selected by him. And if those things were true, then 2 Corinthians 12, 12 says that there would be signs and wonders that would accompany that calling. But when he gathered the church together, the elders from Ephesus on that beach there at Miletus, we are told in Acts 20, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders, plural, of the church. In like fashion, listen to what the apostle James said in the fifth chapter of his epistle. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Notice, too, it's elders, not elder. It's not the elder of the church. It's not the elders of the churches. But the, it's the elders, plural, of the church, singular. And so if there was a sick person in the fellowship, and contextually this person is sick because they have been under the discipline of the Lord that ultimately comes through the hand of the leadership in a local assembly and they have become weak or sick, like Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 10, and now they are coming in repentance, and the elders are willing to lay hands on them for their healing. But there's a plurality of elders. And so in the New Testament, there's not one elder, but a plurality of elders. Now, please don't forget that for nearly the first 200 years of church history, the church did not meet in buildings like this. They met in homes. Due to the oppression of the Roman government, due to the persecution that came upon born-again believers, they met in house churches. And it's clear that in every city in these various houses, there was a group of elders that gave leadership. Now, we don't know definitively whether every single house church had an elder or possibly more than one elder. But we do know that they worked together in every town, every village, every city, and they came together and they led together. That's the assumption that the Apostle James is speaking of here in James 5 and verse 17. Now, this forces us to ask a question. Where is it that some churches, some denominations, have developed a single elder form of government? Well, most would appeal to the seven churches of the Revelation that Jesus wrote a letter to. If you remember, we just finished a study of the Revelation. It was the last book that we covered. It took over three years to go through it. But with each of the seven churches, he said, to the angel of the church in Ephesus and Pergamum and Smyrna and Thyatira, whatever it was, to the angel of the church. Well, who is he referring to when he says the angel of the church? And I go through this in great detail. If you're interested and you're online, download the phone app, search the scriptures, and you can listen to some of those messages in the seven churches. So who are the angels? Are these literal, actual angels, that fixed number that God created, some of which rebelled and we call demons today, some who are holy and elect angels? Or are these pastors, people that he is speaking of. Well, understand that the challenge, the problem, concerns more our English Bible than it does the Greek New Testament, or for that matter, most other languages of the world that translate these verses. So, one of two positions. Some say, well, these are literal angels 
who are taking care of various congregations. Some would describe them even as guardian angels over the church. There's a problem with that. Number one is Christ is giving a message to each of these angels to deliver to the church. And we learn in 1 Corinthians 11 that, that angels don't preach to the church. Angels are actually learning from the church. Whenever we meet corporately, there's more in our congregation than you see with the physical eye. Angels observe, and there is untold numbers of angels, hundreds of millions, probably billions of angels that God created. So the thought that angels are going to deliver a letter and preach to a church is very convoluted, and it doesn't dovetail with the rest of Scripture. A second view that was held for nearly 1,500 years of church history is that these are not literal angels, but these are human messengers. And I should say that the word angel, angelos in Greek, means a messenger. And the word angel, malach in Hebrew, means a messenger. And the term can be used of a literal angel or someone who is functioning as an angel, as a messenger. And so how do, are we to understand it? Well, there again, like for instance in Daniel chapter 6, if you remember, there was an angel that closed the mouths of the lion, lions and protected Daniel. Those were literal, actual angels. Also, that word malach, angel, is used of people. For instance, in the book of Malachi, the second chapter, the priest is called the messenger, the malach, the Angelos in the Greek Old Testament of the Lord. John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Lord, who is mentioned in Malachi chapter 3, is called an angel. When you come into the New Testament, for instance, in Luke 1, 26, now in the sixth month, the angel, Angelos, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. That's a literal angel. That's not a human, obviously. In Luke chapter 7, John's disciples, like John, are called angels. When the messengers, it's the word angels, just in the plural, when the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. So almost in every language, it's not an issue. It becomes an issue in English because sometimes we translate it and sometimes, or interpret the word, or sometimes we don't tr translate it. Uh, years ago, I was in the Ukraine, and some of the sisters made a cross stitch, and I have it, and it said, to the angel Carl in Beaufort. Now, they didn't mean I was a literal angel, but they meant I was a pastor. And Christ is speaking to seven churches, to uh, seven pastors. And so today, we have the idea of a senior pastor. Elders in an assembly are equal, but there's a first among equals. If I named, you know, Grace Community Church or First Baptist uh, Dallas or some church, there's probably a pastor that comes to your mind. Yet if the truth were told, both of those churches have a plurality of pastors or elders that shepherd that congregation. But the thought is, is that there's typically a leader amongst equals. We today often refer to him as the senior pastor. And so it's not surprising that the Lord Jesus would address a single elder or a single pastor in the seven churches. But I don't think for a moment that he is discounting what he would later inspire his apostles to write. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said this, let the elders, 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders who rule well be considered of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. Now, while all elders must be apt to teach and sound in doctrine, that's a mark of spiritual maturity. And we have just learned recently in our three messages from the book of Hebrews that that is something that God wants to be true of every born-again, blood-bought child of God. He wants you to grow up so that you are able, in some sense, to teach. But while all elders are to be sound and mature in that way, not all elders are gifted and called of God to preach and teach the Word of God. So Paul here uses the term double honor to avoid sliding the other elders, and yet at the same time to recognize that some men are called to preach. 
but to call some as preachers and to give them double honor, that is, they're paid a salary, is not justification for making a distinction between clergymen and lay elders, as some people do. No, elders are equals. And together they shepherd the church of God. And so again, while all elders are apt to teach sound in doctrine, some are gifted to carry that out. They are to lead in that way. And in some churches it might be one man, and larger churches there might be a number of people who do it. But I think it's important that we recognize that God has put some safeguards in the church to keep a man with an unholy ambition from excelling. And so he gives a group of men who guard the church. Now, in some churches, I will say that deacons function as elders, but then you lose the office of deacon in the New Testament. There's a plurality of elders and a plurality of deacons that are described in the New Testament church. But not only are they several in number, secondly, I want us to think about the fact that elders are to be seasoned in their walk. They are to be seasoned in their walk. Again, verse 1, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder. Now, we just read from the opening verse to the church at Philippi, that there were elders, plural, and deacons, plural. The office of elder leads. The deacons serve at the will of the elders. There's a very clear, definitive job description for an elder. There's not one as such for the deacons, though historically deacons have taken on certain responsibilities in the church. But deacons serve at the will of the elders in the local assembly. And the word deacon just means a servant. And sometimes in a non-technical way, all Christians are called deacons and that we are all to be servants. He that would be great among you must be the deacon, the servant of all. But in a technical way, there's an office of which one must be qualified to meet. So sadly today, people have redefined some of the words like pastor or overseer. And in the older English, it's not overseer, but bishop. But the words elder, pastor, overseer, um, are used interchangeably of the same office in the New Testament. But some churches have created a hierarchy of leadership. So you have a pastor, and then above the local church, you have kind of a super pastor, a super elder. We often call him the bishop in some denominational structures, and he kind of moves pastors around. But you do not see that distinction in the New Testament, though I think it's important to note that God uses different words to describe this singular office because each word that he uses in some way expresses the role that the office is to take. So the word bishop or overseer, episcopon, speaks of the responsibility of the office. The term elder speaks of the spiritual maturity of the office. It is true that the word presbuteros can be used to describe an older person But when it's used in reference to the New Testament office, it's describing not age, it's describing spiritual maturity. And so when Paul gives the the qualifications for an elder in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus chapter 1, he gives 22 qualifications. And Peter adds an additional one in 1 Peter 5. But he uses these words interchangeably. So Paul writes, for instance, to Timothy, and he said, an overseer must be. He writes to Titus, and he said, for this reason, I left you in Crete, that you might set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. And then he says in the next breath, for an overseer must be, and he goes to the singular. Why? Because each and every overseer or elder or pastor must meet the qualifications that are described. But what I want you to see is that the term elder and overseer are used in the same paragraph of the same person, just like it's done that way in Acts chapter 20. And so you might want to study those characteristics because an elder is to be an example to the flock. And so those characteristics are something that you want ultimately to characterize your life. You may not be formally in the office of elder, but you may shepherd some group of people in a Bible study, in an adult Bible fellowship, maybe sixth graders in a Awana class. And if you're a dad, you've got children 
that you are called to shepherd. And if you read those 22 characteristics, while there can be some overlap, they basically fall into four categories. There's the personal character, there's the public testimony, there's the family life, and then there are those ministry scales, skills. And of course, they can overlap. So for instance, if there is a family failure, then there will be a ministry and personal failure, and so on we could argue. But understand, it's not elderly men. There are people who age physically but do not grow up spiritually. And you could potentially have a 25-year-old who's been a, a believer for five years who's more qualified to serve in the office of elder than someone who is 60 years old and who's never grown up in the faith. So it's not an issue of age, it's an issue of spiritual maturity. And remember, Titus and Timothy, as you read those two pastoral epistles, as we've called them for the last 400 years or so, they were younger men. And sometimes as a younger man, it can be intimidating. I came here, I was 33 years old, over 30 years ago. And at times I felt a little intimidated, so I understand what Paul wrote to Timothy. Like, who are you, this young whippersnapper, telling me who's got three decades on you how I should live or what I should do? Who gave you authority over me? And the answer is God did, because God called me. So Paul says to Titus, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. He tells his young protege in the faith, Timothy, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. So an elder must have a seasoned walk. And so the warning in 1 Timothy 3, 6, and not a new convert, lest he become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And how many churches have suffered greatly? because they've ignored that principle. They put someone in leadership, oh, he's a fine businessman, or he's got a PhD after his name, or whatever, but they were not spiritually qualified for the office. These are important qualifications, and a church will stand or fall based on its leadership, and so they need to be spiritually mature. Listen, it's a real spiritual battle. The bullets are real. And we need the right men, and I say men because the office of pastor is not for women. Take all the chatter that's out there in evangelicalism. Even the president of the Southern Baptist Convention said, a woman can preach on Sunday morning as long as it's not some new doctrinal issue that the other elders. That's a lie. That's not true. That's snuggling up to the world, wanting people to like you. And we do a great disservice to women when we reverse roles and we ask them to do something that God has not called them to do. Listen, there are some things in the church that only women can do, and there are some things in the church that only men can do, and it has nothing to do with equality. It has everything to do with the role that God has called us to carry out. But not a new convert. Listen, forget the eldership. Sometimes people will bring across our platform some famous person and we think, oh, this famous person, you know, everybody admires him. He'll win people to Jesus. And then we see him crash and burn because we violated the application of a basic principle, not a new convert, lest he become conceited. So elders are several in number. They're seasoned in their walk. Third on your outline, elders are to be shepherds in their care. Shepherds in their care. Now, there are many figures in the Bible used to describe Christ's relationship to his people. And here he is using the analogy of sheep. The psalmist said, know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. In fact, there are seven figures that are employed in the New Testament church to describe Christ's relationship to the church. And if you've taken in the Institute of Biblical Studies my course in ecclesiology, I go through these in great detail. And this would be a good study maybe this week because each of these figures say something about Christ's relationship to his people and our relationship to him. For instance, he's described as the head and we are described as his body. He is described as the vine, and we are described as his branches. He is described as the chief cornerstone, the foundation, 
and we are described as the living stones. He is described as the last Adam, and we are the new creation. He is described as the bridegroom, and we are his bride. He is described as the high priest, and we are a kingdom of priests. And in our text this morning, he is described as the chief shepherd, and we are described as the sheep. And again, each figure delineates some different aspect of our relationship to the Lord Jesus. So why does he use the analogy of sheep to describe us? Well, there are many reasons. Among one, sheep are wayward. And Peter, basically quoting Isaiah 53, has already stated in 1 Peter 2, For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. So sheep are wayward. They need a shepherd. Sheep are weak. And so they really can't protect themselves. And they need someone to watch them, to guard them. And Peter's going to key off of this in just a moment. But God also uses the analogy of sheep because sheep are animals with great worth. And in the first century, often a man's wealth was measured by the number of sheep that he had because they provided wool and milk and meat and more sheep, more lambs. But clearly, God values the sheep. Jesus said this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so because the sheep are wayward, because the sheep are weak, because the sheep are of great worth, they need shepherds who will guard them, who will protect them. And so the local church is really a picture of a flock. And it's not surprising then that the elders are deemed shepherds or pastors accountable to the chief shepherd. Again, we read here in verse 1, Therefore I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder, shepherd the flock of God among you. Now that term shepherd, poema o, is a word that we use to describe a pastor. So we speak of a shepherd who is a pastor. He cares for the flock. So not only am I an elder and an overseer, I'm a shepherd. I'm a pastor. And so the elder is to be spiritually mature, and he is to guard and watch over that flock. Now the qualifications are largely given in 1 Peter 5, but primarily in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3. But the actual job description is given to us in Acts chapter 20. If you have a Bible, hold your finger here and turn back to the book of Acts and go to the 20th chapter for just a moment. Acts chapter 20. Acts is a record of the first 30 years of church history. Acts 1.8 is the outline. Uh, you shall make disciples. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's Acts 1 through 7. In Judea and Samaria, that's Acts 8 through 12, and then to the remotest part of the earth. That's 13 through the end of the book. Well, Paul is on one of his missionary journeys, and rather than go all the way to Ephesus, he calls the Ephesus to meet him there at the shoreline on his return trip. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 20. He speaks, How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable in teaching you publicly. And from house to house, solemnly warning, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then notice what he tells the elders in verse 24. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul was with this church longer than any church in his entire ministry, three years in Ephesus. And Paul said, you know me, my whole time there, among other things, I solemnly testified of the gospel of the grace of God. He was like an evangelist. And Timothy, who probably did not have the gift of evangelism, is admonished by the apostle Paul to do the work of an evangelist. And so a pastor, among other things, is to evangelize. He is to be involved in reaching out for those lost sheep who are brought into the flock as new lambs. And so there's a balance in Scripture. While he is to teach the existing Christians, he is to be involved in reaching those who are lost. Listen, if I preach about doing evangelism and I don't do it, 
then I'm a hypocrite. And if I'm a pastor and all I want to do is teach and not evangelize, then I am not carrying out my God-given responsibility. Part of shepherding the flock is reaching people in the fold that need to come into the kingdom. Second, a pastor is not only one who preaches the gospel of the grace of God, he's one who teaches. Again, look at Acts 20, 20. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house. And then he adds in verse 27, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Paul didn't whitewash his sermons. He didn't just tell people what they wanted to hear. He preached the whole purpose of God, which included the hard things and some of the things that were pleasurable to preach. We live in a day where pastors don't want to preach the hard things. They just want to whitewash it. They want to give people, you know, a sugar stick to suck on, but not any of the broccoli and cauliflower that they need to grow up in the Lord. And so a man of God is to be filled with the Spirit of God. He's to come behind this pulpit of God. He's to preach the Word of God that the children of God might grow up. And if he doesn't do that, the sheep are malnourished, and they will struggle. They will be weak. And they, in turn, won't do what they're supposed to do. And that is to evangelize. But the biblical principle is that healthy sheep reproduce. Sadly, I deal with churches all the time. I'm on a Zoom call next week with a problem church. They've asked me to help them. And sometimes, you know, a pastor, all he's doing is putting out fires. This problem, that problem. And he lets those fires distract him where he is not doing what he needs to do. Speaking with a young pastor, inherited a church filled with problems. I said, just start preaching the word. Be faithful to it. Some of the problem people will leave. But if you will not only preach the word, but you will do the work of an evangelist sooner or later, you'll start seeing so many new people come into that church that they will outlead all the old guard that needs to go. Listen, a pastor leads by example. And the sheep, if they are being fed, they will grow and healthy sheep will reproduce. And so many people, they think they can hire a gun like me to do the work of evangelism for them. You can't hire me to evangelize the people that God's called you to preach to, to share the good news of Christ with. Now, we might do it together in some instances, but there are people in your world, in your sphere, that I will never meet. And God wants you to do what you can to try to minister to them. And so a pastor, among other things, he devotes himself to the Bible to preach the gospel of grace, that he might preach the whole counsel of Scripture, and he devotes himself to prayer. And so he prays, he teaches the saints, he evangelizes the lost. These are like critical non-negotiables. Look at verse 29 when he speaks to the Ephesian elders. Part of what a pastor does is he's to protect the flock. Verse 29, I know after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Jesus in John 10 spoke of wolves. It would come in. It would come in like sheep, but they were wolves on the inside, and their intention is to destroy the sheep. Peter is getting ready to give a warning in verse 8 of our passage. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Good elders are on the alert. Why? Because he knows the devil wants to destroy his people. And when you have new Christians, look out. Because they're like magnets for cults. It's just like the devil knows. Let me go trip up these new believers. And again, there's an assumption that there's new tender little sheep in the flock, which, by the way, is a reason why every pastor has to avoid the temptation of those who put pressure on them. Why are you preaching that message again? Why are you teaching that truth again? Give us some deeper stuff. People who think that way are totally out of touch. 
Those are people who have lost touch with the lost world because when there's new sheep coming in, they always need to hear it. And some are hearing what you've heard for decades for the first time. And so we see new Christians by God's grace every month coming to this fellowship and the cults go after them. Or because they're so hungry and they lack discernment, they're, they're, they're on the internet and they're looking at this and there's so much theological garbage on the internet today. And so an elder is to protect and he is to lead that flock. The word shepherd implies leadership and direction. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so like a shepherd leads the sheep, so the elder does in the local assembly. Now, some people have developed in their mind that the local church should be a democracy. The only problem with that is that is impossible to substantiate from Scripture. The assumption in Scripture is that elders lead, that they rule, and they are worthy of the people's respect, assuming they are qualified. Listen to this verse from the writer to the Hebrews. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Likewise, in 1 Timothy 5, 17, Paul speaks of the elders who rule well, indicating that they have authority from God. Now, that may seem un-American in the face of the culture in which we live. And so, in many of our churches, many of our evangelical churches, we have succumbed to a democracy of sorts. But if you read the New Testament... The local assembly is not a democracy. It's a theocracy with a chief shepherd over us all and then under shepherds or pastors who come alongside under his leadership. And sadly, in many churches, the pastors, the elders really aren't leaders. They stand up in some business meeting of a church and they bring up some issue and they say, all you who are in favor of this issue say bah, and all you who are against this issue say bah, and they count the bahs over here and the bahs over here, and that's how they lead. That's not how God runs the church. And listen, when a church is run that way, you have a formula for disaster because in every local church, you have four groups. You have brand new Christians who lack discernment. You have older Christians who have never grown up. They've stayed babes in Christ for decades. You may have some carnal Christians who are out of fellowship with the Lord. And as Jesus taught in every church membership, you're always going to have some unbelievers. Not because you want an unbeliever to join your church, but the wheat and the tare will be mixed together until the time of the harvest. And you give those four groups of people an equal voice and an equal vote, and you have a formula for bickering, a church fight, and a church split. Look, many churches in America were not started by people who are passionate. Oh, we need to go plant another church church. It was just a group of people who couldn't get along with their fellow Christians, and that largely fell on the way the church was structured. And so I mentioned to you, some churches are run by committees, and somebody well said, a committee is nothing more than the unfit appointed by the unwilling to do the unnecessary, and it always ends up in a fight, doesn't it? Where do you get that in the New Testament? The church is run by committees. That is not a New Testament principle. Elders are to rule. Look again in our text in 1 Peter 5 and verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. So sheep are able to follow a shepherd because with integrity he leads by example. Again, plain and clear, obey your leaders, submit to them. And let me just say parenthetically, the obedience that God calls you to in a local assembly is not a blind obedience like to some cultic leader. The rest of the New Testament affirms that we are to be discerning and that it is not an intelligent submission. The apostles stood up. And they said, when challenged by the religious leaders of their day, no, we must obey God rather than men. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter has already enjoined women, wives, to submit, to obey, and to respect their husbands. But their obedience, their submission to their husband is not a blind obedience. It's within the confines of the will of God. 
And that's why we need to find out what this book says because our obedience is based on the scripture. And if a pastor is contradicting himself on moral issues, and we've got that now. We've got a TK, a Tim Keller, who is saying same-sex attraction is okay. It doesn't need to be repented of. It can be embraced just as long as you don't act on it. My friend, that is heresy. That is evil. That is wrong. Same-sex attraction, if you are converted, needs to be brought under the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, just like a new Christian who might be struggling with heterosexual loss. No, we need to be careful that, that, that when, when God's word is taught, that God's principles are plain. And you don't just follow a person because he's a nice guy. When I came to this town, there was a pastor of a Baptist church, a super nice guy. But he denied the miracles in the Bible. And he'd teach a course over there at the local university. And they have all these Marines coming through. Well, you know, Dr. So-and-so said, you know, that, you know, this didn't really happen. And... You don't follow someone because they're a nice guy. We have churches in our town, two churches that do gay marriages, two churches that deny the infallibility of the Word of God, and some who don't even think about it. Look at it, it's not a blind obedience. It's based on the Scripture. And so, listen, elders are to be several in number, seasoned in their walk, and there are to be shepherds in their care. Those are the attributes. Second, the attitude of an elder. Let's think for a moment about the attitude of an elder. Three attitudes that elders are to maintain as they serve the people. And they're spelled out here in verses 2 and 3. First, elders are to have an attitude of willingness. They are to have an attitude of willingness. We read here in verse 2, Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God. So the shepherd, he must serve the Lord with a willing heart. It's not just a job that he has as a pastor, as a preacher, as an elder. I am to voluntarily, willingly serve the Lord. This is not something I have to do. This is something I want to do. And if someone's in the ministry and it's something he has to do and he doesn't want to, be, want to do it, something's wrong. He's either unqualified or he has lost his passion and love for Jesus Christ. Not under compulsion, but voluntarily. I hear about people saying, well, I had to fight the call to preach. I had to surrender to the ministry. I don't really know what they're speaking about. This is a job that you willingly, voluntarily do it. In the providence of God, he put the germ in my heart to preach, and I can't think of doing anything else. I thought about it again this week. If I were not a pastor of a church, what would I do? And my mind can't go anywhere because it's what God has called me to. Paul said, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And so, if a man of God is called as an elder, there's a holy want to in his heart to serve the people of God. And I'm thrilled to be the pastor of this church. I personally think it is the greatest church on the face of the earth, and I hope you don't mind me thinking that way. And yet, here's Peter. Here's Peter who had been called of God, and he has to tell and remind these elders Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God. Why would he have to give that kind of instruction to elders? One, to make sure our hearts are guarded because the ministry can become a job instead of a ministry. Do you remember that occasion when the Lord Jesus, post-resurrection, met those men on the same beach? He actually called them on. Some of you have visited that beach with me. And he restored Peter publicly. He had already restored him privately. And if you remember, Peter denied the Lord Jesus three times. And so three times Jesus asks Peter about his love. And we won't get into the nuances on the word, but Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Not the boats, not the nets, but these disciples. He said, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said, feed my lambs. Do you love me more than these? Remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he said, Lord Jesus, I don't know about these guys, 
but I will never deny you. If necessary, I will give my life for you. And so three times Jesus says, do you love me? And three times the Lord Jesus encourages Peter with three commands. Feed my lambs. Shepherd my sheep. Feed my sheep. Listen, one of the most important things a pastor can do if he really loves the Lord Jesus is to feed my sheep. And he uses first in the first command, lambs. And it's the diminutive. You could say little baby lambs. In other words, Peter, if you love me, go and graze those little baby lambs. I want you to feed them. I think many people think it's their ministry to criticize the lambs, especially new Christians, because they don't match up to the life that they have been living. I don't find that commission in the New Testament. He says, you are to tend them, look after them with food, feed them. And so again, there's an assumption that there are new believers in the church, but there's an assumption because he speaks of young lambs and older Christians that there are older believers. And in every sermon, you have to minister to the newest Christian and to the oldest Christian and everything in between. And so the Lord wants his pastors to know, you really love me then you feed my people. And sheep that are not fed are weak. They are malnourished. They are diseased. That's why we have so many who drive an hour every week. That's why we have so many who who live stream in the first service to go to their church in the second service because the pastor doesn't open up the Bible. And some pastors have lost perspective and they're doing 10,000 things that they shouldn't be doing. He is to evangelize the lost, number one. He is to teach the saved, number two. He is to spend time alone with God in prayer that make those first two real. And he is to guard and protect the flock. And some people get mad at me when I name some false teacher or some cult. That's part of my job. I have to protect my people. And it's part of helping these new Christians to stay on track. Notice again, look at the wisdom of this verse. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising over oversight, not, here's the not, but, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. If God's pastors would feed God's people, their ministry would change. Some of the fires that they spend 24-7 trying to put out, they would just go out. You'll always have fires. You'll always have problem people, especially tear in the church. But the vast majority of the people will be healthy. And let me just say to you, no matter what you do in this church, I don't care if you serve in children's ministries, teach Sunday school, Awana, lead an ABF, maybe you're an usher, a greeter, you work out in the parking lot, whatever capacity you serve in, you need to walk in close fellowship with the Lord. You need to stay close where your heart is warm towards him because otherwise it will be something you have to do rather than something you want to do. Your ministry needs to be an overflow of your walk with Jesus Christ. So elders are to have an attitude of willingness. And again, they're modeling for the flock what they want their people to be. But elders, too, are to have an attitude of eagerness, an attitude of eagerness. Look again in verse 2. But voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. So the motivation is not for sordid gain, for financial profit. The heart of a pastor that is filled for a love of money rather than a love for ministry is a heart that is not in love with Christ. Look, I feel bad for people who hate their jobs. You're looking at a man who loves to do what God has called him to do. Why do I do it? Because you pay me? No, not at all. In fact, you don't pay me. You give your money to God, and then he pays me. And you ought to do that because that's what people are supposed to do. Paul said to Timothy, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, defining double honor versus honor, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his rages. Wages, And so while it's entirely appropriate for some elders to receive a paycheck because they are earning their living from the gospel, he is never to be motivated by money. And God knows I would pay the, for the privilege 
to preach the word of God. Listen, for the first 12 and a half years I was in ministry, I had to raise my own salary. With this missions group that I was with, I mean, my family didn't understand it. They said, Carl, you've just got a degree. You just went through the CPA program. What are you doing? You're going to get paid one-fourth of what you could start at just in your first year, and then it would go up. And you have to raise the money, give it to this organization so they can pay you a salary. It didn't make sense, but it's what God had called me to do. Listen, when I was in seminary, I'd meet some of these guys who were moaning and groaning that no pulpit committee had called them. During seminary, I was a pastor of evangelism as I worked with a missions organization of a large 4,000-member church. And I would tell some of these guys, look, if no church is calling you, don't worry about it. God's called me to be a senior pastor, and if no one calls me, I'll go and plant my own church. I'd been involved in startup ministries before, and I knew that by God's grace and because he has a passion, he wants people to come to Christ 10,000 times more than you want to, I could see it happen. Look, in the last 40 plus years I've been preaching, I've preached in all kinds of settings. I've preached on the streets in Boston and in Vienna. I've preached on the beaches in Daytona. I've preached on university campuses. I've preached to athletic teams. I've preached to fraternities, to sororities, to churches, to rescue missions, in prisons, and a host of other places. And in a few of those places, I was run off. But I preach not because I'm paid to preach, but because God has called me to preach. From on high, Jeremiah said, from on high, he has sent fire into my bones. Every now and then, I will hear someone say, well, that pastor left our church because another church offered him more money. Listen, a pastor should never do that. A pastor who is motivated by money is what Jesus called a hireling. And in my judgment, he ought not to be a pastor. Can you say amen to that? Ezekiel the prophet warned against such shepherds. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, thus says the Lord God, woe shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? Jesus put it in these words in John 10. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. And in my estimation, any pastor who's in the church for the money has no business in being in that church. He's just fleecing the flock instead of feeding the flock. And we've seen in the last 24 months some of these big shot pastors who made a fortune and now they've apostatized and renounced the faith, but they got their money that they wanted. And many times when things get tough, people completely withdraw. But let me say to you, you have no business of potentially leaving your job and going to another job for more money. Now, I don't know if you can say amen to that. But listen, it took no less of the blood of Christ to buy me than it did to buy you. And God is interested where he has planted you. And if he has put you in a church where your family is flourishing and you are growing, you don't say, well, the, this, the company offered me $30,000 more if I'd moved to this city. It's a settled deal. No, it's not a settled deal. God may not want you to go to that job. And sometimes people have done so at great detriment and at great cost. So he says, and not for a sort of gain, but then he adds, with eagerness. Why does he add that phrase, with eagerness? Because God knows the potential of the human flesh as it relates to the nature of ministry itself. I mean, how do you really measure what a pastor does? Most of what I do, you never see. You don't see when I pray and fast. You don't see the people I counsel, the phone calls I have to make the people I have to exhort, the time I spend over the Scripture. You can't measure the ministry by wickets. Ah, you know, I got this done. You know, that's one of the reasons I love to cut my lawn. <laughs> when I'm done, it's like, hey, there's my, that's my hobby. I cut the grass. I got something. It's done. It's, you can see it. But I don't live for the things that are seen. 
I live for the things that are not seen. Pastor said to me, I've been so disappointed. No one comes down for the invitation. The harvest is not at the end of the church hour. It's at the end of the age. And there will be things that will go on that you will never see. Just be faithful. It's a sacred... It's a sacred position God has given a man to discharge. And you see, the ministry is such that it's a good place technically to be lazy. Because you see, you can't see some of these hidden things. And you can fool your people, but you will not fool the chief shepherd when he appears and you have to give an account. Elders, an attitude of willingness, an attitude of eagerness. Third, they are to have an attitude of meekness. Look at verse 3. Not as yet lording it over their, uh, those allotted to your charge, but proving examples to the flock. An elder is not some ecclesiastical priest. He's not some big shot bishop. He's not some dictator. He's a servant. And I know there are some pastors who are saying we should call ourselves CEOs. That just grinds against my heart because that is so contrary to the tenor of Scripture. Peter opened this chapter, Therefore exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder. Peter was the great apostle, but he was also a pastor. He was a fellow elder. All elders are not apostles, but all apostles are elders. And he described himself as a fellow elder. Listen, if Peter was the first pope, he didn't know anything about it. He didn't see himself as some kind of a king. He saw himself as one who would share in the responsibilities and the problems and the challenges. You know, we got these big shots who come through town and they preach and everybody, hooray, 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 and they never have to deal with the problems. Peter had a different kind of mindset. Shepherd the flock, not as yet lording it over, allotted to your charge, but proving to be an example. Much like Paul was able to say, be ye followers of me as I follow or imitate Christ. It's leadership. You don't drive the sheep, you lead the sheep. And the local church needs leaders who will serve, servants who lead. And listen, as an, as an elder, I have to lead by example. I have no right to ask you to do what I'm not doing. If I'm not sharing my faith, how can I ask you to share your faith? If I'm not giving at least a tithe to the local assembly, how can I ask you to do it? If I'm not praying for some specific need or event, how can I ask you to do it? We lead by example. Now, I want you to notice the interplay of words. Let me put verses 2 and 3 together for a moment here in the slide. Shepherd the flock of God among. Circle that word among in your Bible. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Then he says in verse 3, nor yet as lording it over. Circle that word over. Nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge. So it's by being an example that the shepherd solves the tension here among being among the sheep and at the same time being over the sheep. People are to follow a good example, a biblical example. But unfortunately, one of the problems today is, again, we have this celebrity mentality rather than a servant mentality. And so we're not to think our, of ourselves as sovereigns, as elders, as pastors. We are to think of ourselves as Jesus described himself. For the Son of Man did not come to serve, I mean to be served, but to serve and to give himself a ransom for many. Quickly, beyond the attitude of an elder, I want us to finally look at the accountability of an elder. He now says in verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, keep in mind, while every believer is eligible for different crowns, and if you want to study that, we covered in our 45-week discovery class for new Christians, which I'm doing on Wednesday nights. I'll pick it back up in November, God willing. And I covered it in the Revelation in our series there because it came up. But there is a special crown for the elder, for the pastor. It's called the unfading 
crown of glory. And so there are two truths about the elder's crown I learned. First, the review of the elder is serious. The review of the elder is serious. Now, please notice the title given to the Lord Jesus here in verse 4. He's called the chief shepherd. And this is one of three titles given to our Lord that connect him as our shepherd. For instance, in John 10, he called himself the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. In Hebrews chapter 13, he called himself the great shepherd. Now, the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep. Three titles, the good shepherd, because as the good shepherd, he died for the sheep. As the great shepherd, he is watching over the sheep and making intercession for the sheep. And as the chief shepherd, one of these days, maybe sooner than we we realize he's coming back for the sheep and we will be with him forever. And so in the past, he died for us. In the present, he watches over us. But some glorious day in the future, he's coming back for us. And when the chief shepherd appears, you, you elders, will receive the unfading crown of glory. And of course, to speak of Jesus as the chief shepherd, that makes us under shepherds. And since one of these days he is coming back, we are going to give an account. And it's a serious judgment. The word stewardship is one of, the word steward is used in three times in the New Testament. And one of the times it's used in reference to the elders of the church. Why? Because stewardship involves accountabilities. The writer of the Hebrew says, obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. And so with a greater standard of responsibility, there's a greater standard of accountability. James said it this way, let not many of you become teachers, speaking here of the office of teacher or pastor. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such you will incur a stricter judgment. Some positions of leadership... It require greater responsibility, and with it comes greater accountability. Jesus said, and from everyone who has been given much shall much be required. To whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. Listen, if you're listening to me and you're a pastor, God is going to go through the quality of your leadership someday. And God speaks of the fact that we are not only responsible for a congregation of people, but we are responsible to the Lord Jesus. We will give an account. Every sermon you preach, every phone call you make, every person you counter counsel, every person you evangelize, Jesus is going to evaluate it someday. The chief shepherd is going to come, and someday every one of us will give an account of himself to God. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. It's the judgment of the just. It takes place in heaven to see how God will reward you throughout all of eternity. Shepherd the flock of God. It's not a conditional command. Shepherd them only if they don't give you trouble. Shepherd them only if they stay in line. Shepherd them only if they love you. Shepherd them only if they don't make any demands on you, especially at an ungodly hour. No, shepherd them, period. And so the review of the elder is serious. Secondly, the reward to the elder is gracious. We don't deserve anything, but that God would reward us in addition to his own presence in the glorious place that we will spend eternity in. He says in verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I've had people ask me many times over the last 30 years I've been your pastor, how do you pastor such a large congregation of people? How can you please all these people? I don't even begin to try. I've learned that if I try to please you, I will displease him. If I'm going to preach this book faithfully, I will disappoint people. Some people come here for the first time, and before the service is over, they get up and they walk out. Not everyone who serves in the office of elder is going to receive the unfading crown of glory, and it would be better for a man not to serve in the office of elder if he is not going to take his responsibilities seriously. 
But the reward, it's undeserved. It's gracious. And let me say parenthetically that the vast majority of God's pastors in this world do not really, quote, unquote, shepherd big churches. Today we talk about the big preachers and the big churches. But when the chief shepherd comes, we'll really find what the big churches were and who the big preachers are because there are some men who pastor in obscure places at some crossroad somewhere and no one knows their name but the chief shepherd knows their name and they are using their gifts and their abilities to the max And some of those who are prominent will be asked to step down. And some of those whom you have never heard of will be asked to step up. And so it will be, as Jesus said, that many who are first now will be last. And those who are last will be first. Now look up here and let's think about how we're going to apply this text to our lives today. Let me share three applications as we close. Number one, ask yourself, as a leader in God's church, how are you measuring up? If you are in a position of leadership in God's church, and even if you're not because you are to emulate the leaders who are to be examples, how are you measuring up? And most of us have some area of responsibility. Some of you dads, you've got a little flock that God has entrusted to you, and that flock is precious to the Lord. And if we would just do it well in our evangelical families with our kids, the church would be far different. I hope you understand that whenever I preach on this subject, I always take a hard look at my own life. See, I know too much scripture to know the seriousness of the judgment that is before me. I know too much of the Bible to ignore a time of self-reflection and self-evaluation. Now, you may not be an elder, but the elders are to be an example, and you are called to follow. So how are you doing? And by the way, as a follower, how are you doing? You know, we've had a little controversy about mass. I meant to hit this the first service, but ran out of time. We don't have a, a mass policy, no seat, no mask. Some think we should. We didn't go that far. But neither do we have no mass at all. And don't tell me these churches where there's no mass at all that no one's getting sick. If you're in a big church and there's no mass, I guarantee that we've had 18 people get COVID in this church. Thank God nobody has been hospitalized. As far as I know, none of them caught it here in this assembly. But the elders have asked you to wear a mask till you get to your seat. If you're an elder, a deacon, an usher, a greeter, a parking lot worker. And we encourage people to wear a mask, even if they're not in those categories, at least until the time they get to their seat. Why? Because there are people who will not come to this church unless they see some kind of mask policy. They want to see something. And I don't want to say to you, you're unimportant. We don't care about you. I don't care if you come to this church. I don't want to have that kind of attitude. Dozens of our African Americans aren't coming here yet for the simple reason they're a high risk group, and I get that. Look, I had a young couple in their 20s last week thanking me that we had some kind of mass policy. So don't tell me, well, all the young couples want everything opened up. That's not true. And you do not have your thumb on the pulse beat like I do as the pastor because there's a lot of opinions on this subject and they go across the board. So we're just asking you to respect your leaders and don't go online and run us down and say, let's have a revolt. That's the opposite of what God is asking us to do. You think I like wearing these goofy masks? I hate it. And I hope by God's grace it will be over soon. But I don't want to keep lost people from not coming here and save people from not coming because I am too prideful and too independent and I'm too cool. I don't wear a mask. So how are you following? Secondly, That's a little rant. I didn't mean to get that far. (laughs) Are you one of his sheep? Are you? 
Do you know that you're saved? Do you know for certain that if the chief shepherd were appear today that you'd go to heaven? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. Do you respond to the voice, the word of God, the voice of the shepherd is found in scripture? Has he given you eternal life? And has your life been born from above so that it is changed? Because if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. And we have this mass of people in evangelicalism today who say they are saved and their life has never changed and they are so deceived. You say, no, I've received the chief shepherd. The Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. I've been born again. My life has changed. And I've been willing unashamedly to make a public confession of him before people. Then I would simply ask you this question. Are you a part of a local flock? Have you identified with a local church? You see, God knows nothing of unchurched people in the New Testament. He assumes that a believer will be willing to put himself under the authority of elders for their protection, for their feeding, and potentially, if needed, for discipline. If you're not one of his sheep, you can be. You can become one today. And if you are one of his sheep and you're not a member, we would love to have you today to become a member of this church. Now, our Father, I thank you for your word today and the opportunity to open it together. And as I've been preaching, the Spirit of God, I know, has been speaking in different ways, not just to my heart, but in the hearts of many that are listening. I pray today, Father, for that dear person who's never received the Lord Jesus. Thank you that you can make the promise that you make, that whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, speaking of Jesus, you said we would be saved instantly for all of eternity. Thank you because you did what you did. You can make that promise. Thank you that you didn't die for some or most, but all of our sin. And if we are willing to come to you calling our sin, sin, that it needs to be forgiven and changed, you said in a moment's time you would forgive us and give us everlasting life. Help someone in simple childlike faith, knowing that you cannot lie, You said it's impossible for you to lie. Help someone in faith to say, Lord Jesus, save me. And Father, for those who have done that and made that kind of decision in years past, but they need a local church, if they're listening online, help them to find a local church in the state they are in. Help them not to waste another week of floating, but to commit themselves to an assembly of believers and help someone even here today to do that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We'll sing our hymn of invitation. And if you're here and you've received Christ and you've never made it public, Jesus taught if it's real on the inside, you won't be ashamed of it on the outside. Walking an aisle has never saved anyone, but Jesus can make that analogy because he knows if your salvation is real, you're unashamed of Jesus. And it should express itself in baptism. Baptism happens after we're saved as a symbol of the death, burial, and the resurrection, the gospel. If you're here and you're a believer, maybe you've done those things, but you need a church home, we would welcome you here. And so we invite you, whatever your decision is, to leave your seat. We're going to sing all five verses. Some of you just need to sing this as a prayer today out of gratitude for the salvation. But some of you need to put some feet to those prayers and meet me here in the front. Matt, lead us. Would you come?